Thanks very much, Daisy and Rosie, for inviting me. And it's a great pleasure to be here in lockdown London with so many of you. Um, I'm going to uh, launch forthwith into sharing my screen with you. Um, and I'm going to try to explain, in, in indeed, in 12 minutes or so, um, why food is an amazing way of, uh, of seeing our world. Um, and, and I'd like to begin by asking you to contemplate this extraordinary landscape um, and simply to ask you what you see. Um, I mean, if you're anything like me when I first encountered this, roughly about the age of 18 or so, what you see principally is a, a beautiful looking city on the left hand side. In fact, it's the city of Siena and a wonderful landscape on the right hand side. In fact, it looks very much like the landscape that you can see outside the window. Uh, and this curious kind of red wall uh, dividing the two. Um, and actually, if I show you the context in which this landscape takes place, um, you will automatically know something else about it, uh, which is that it's a political image. Um, in fact, it's called the Allegory of the Effects of Good Government. Um, and it sits, as you can see, in this extraordinary so-called Sala de Nove, which is the, the, the Council of Nines chamber um, in the Siennese Town Hall. So what are, as it were, the politicians trying to say to themselves or remind themselves um, by having this amazing picture on the wall? Um, and the short answer is that they're trying to remind themselves that uh, the city and the countryside exist in symbiotic balance, ideally, and therefore that the allegory of the effects of good government is that you have this extraordinary balance. Uh, and indeed it turns out that the red wall is not really a wall at all, but a membrane through which uh, food-related activities are going. So huntsmen are leaving, maybe to go and shoot a boar for dinner. Uh, asses are coming with grain on their backs, pigs being driven to market. Um, and inside there's a flock of sheep wandering around and so on. So the, the thing that I didn't see, amazingly to me now, uh, when I first saw this amazing image at the age of 18 or so on, uh, is that it's all about food. Um, and I find that really interesting. And, you know, I've asked myself many times since, you know, why didn't I see that it was all about food? Um, and I think part of the reason is that food is, is basically everywhere. It's too big to see. Um, and indeed, if we look at what you might call a modern Lawrence Setti, in other words, a modern version of that image, we can see on the left, uh, my home city of London, where I am now, um, on the right hand side, the kinds of landscapes that feed us, and these are not landscapes that we can just see outside our window, but they're often thousands of miles away. And indeed, they're not necessarily the kinds of landscapes that you'd want to paint and stick on a wall either. Um, and I call this the urban paradox. Uh, and the urban paradox is simply, I mean, it's quite interesting, uh, and, and by the way, fantastic to follow amazing speakers uh, like Michael, Jennifer and Patrick, because they've all said stuff for me. Um, we think of ourselves as urban and we talk about ourselves as living in cities, but actually because we're animals, uh, we still rely on the natural world. Um, and the reason it's a paradox is that we have an inherent duality. Uh, and I, for this, <laughs> to contemplate this problem, I like to quote Aristotle, who called us political animals. Um, and so this duality basically gives us a problem when we're trying to work how to live because we're political which means that we need each other, which we means, you know, we need to gather together to be in society and in cities. That's the Athenian agora on the left. But on the other hand, we're animals, which as every speaker so far has reminded us, we need nature. We are, you know, not only for our sustenance, but also for our well-being. So as an architect uh, growing up, you know, the sort of the, the, the problem of, of how to dwell is really a problem of how to solve this duality. Now, you know, I think for most of us living in, living in cities, quote unquote, um, up until about two months ago, you could have been forgiven for thinking that we'd solved the problem, we'd solved the urban paradox, the question of how to feed a city, uh, because, you know, you'd walk into a supermarket anywhere and it looked pretty much like this. Um, so I think for a lot of people, it was a big shock. 
uh, when, again, around about two months ago, um, the virus that's eating humanity kind of came on our doorsteps and all of a sudden we were sort of going shopping and instead staring at this. And indeed, this is my local supermarket. Um, now, it was shocking, but I have to say that uh, for me, it maybe wasn't quite as shocking as it might have been. Because, uh, as I say, this, this illusion of plenty that, that uh, we all live with, uh, to me, very obviously, uh, was indeed that an illusion. Um, and <laughs> in my 12 minutes, I'm just going to try very, very briefly to describe why, or try to explain why, I'm an architect who thinks about food. Um, and I can't explain why, actually, so I don't know why I said that. But, but one of the reasons or the origins of my twin interest in food and architecture, I think, came from the fact that my uh, grandparents had a hotel in Bournemouth, the Hotel Miramar, where I spent all my holidays and most of my weekends and so on. And the incredible thing about this for me was the fact that in the hotel, um, there's a kind of front stage and a backstage. Now, I, I don't have good enough images of the Miramar, so I'm going to actually show you the Savoy Hotel instead. Same principle. There are these amazing public rooms, look incredibly posh and beautiful. And then there are these frantic backstage areas where everything's, you know, chaotic. And at the Miramar, you know, there's literally grease running down the walls and torn up lino and everybody dashing around. Now, as a child, the magic and excitement of the fact that I could move at will between these two areas was, was astonishing, it was extraordinary. Um, and I became obsessed with it in a way, the threshold that that represented. And I suppose what it taught me was that, you know, whenever things look kind of amazing and like swans kind of swimming along the lake, there's, there's feet paddling madly somewhere. Um, and as I say, I'm kind of, cutting a, a sort of my entire life history down to 30 seconds, but it led me when I became an architect, which is one of the things that, you know, something I always wanted to do, to always be kind of suspicious of facadism and, you know, kind of, oh, it's lovely because the Greek temple looks all white and symmetrical. I was always wanting to look around the back and kind of go, you know, yeah, but what's really going on? Um, and it made me realize that, you know, this idea that we live in cities and so on is a complete illusion. It's a falsification. We live in an urban centric world. All the narratives we listen to are urban and so on. Uh, beautifully illustrated by this uh, image of Rome in the 15th century where, you know, everything that's important is in the city. And the, the vital landscape that supports it is just this kind of dribbly bit of green around the edge. This is a much more normal way of seeing the world than the Lawrence Setti. The Lawrence Setti is extraordinary, it's unique in my experience. So again, fast forwarding 30 or 40 years, I wrote a book, um, as Daisy kindly said in her introduction, called Hungry City. My question was simply that, how do you feed a city? Which is quite an interesting question. Uh, in fact, very, very early on, having sort of asked myself this question, which I did in the year 2000, in April, as it turns out, I realise that that's a bit like sort of saying, what is civilization? I mean, it's absolutely enormous question. Um, and it takes us right back to the beginning, you know, the co-evolution, if you like, of farming and urbanity. And very, very briefly, you can't have cities without farming uh, because grain is the only food that we've ever discovered that's capable of feeding large uh, static populations and non-food producing populations. So in the Fertile Crescent and elsewhere in the world, you get the co-evolution of this very radical new way of living, which is about staying in one place rather than hunting and gathering, which is basically following the food around or living in the larder, as I like to call it. Uh, and if we look at those early cities, here's one of them, the city of Ur, um, and all early cities were like this, very, very similarly designed. They're, they're basically, they consist of a kind of a, a small, very dense blob of urbanity, uh, they almost all of them on rivers, they're surrounded by farmland, and in the middle you get this large temple complex, and interestingly the temple was not only the spiritual part of the city, but also it was the administrative heart, basically that was how the harvest, the most important event of the year, was organised, uh, when the food was gathered in, offered to the gods and the ziggurats, stored in the temple granary, cooked in the temple bakery, and then distributed through the city for the rest of the year. So if we were going to ask the question, how did the earliest cities in history feed themselves? We would say they were city-states, that's a, a blob of urbanity surrounded by countryside, 
um, and they had what we would now probably call a large centralized spiritualized food distribution hub uh, in the middle. And as I say, the vast majority of cities followed that model um, until this one came along, which radically broke the mold. Rome had a million citizens by the first century AD. Uh, and so the obvious uh, rather interesting question is how did Rome feed itself? Uh, and normally I like to have a quiz at this point, but since we're rather short of time and you're all invisible, I'll just give you the answer. The answer is three food miles. Now, we think of food miles as a modern phenomenon, and indeed they are a modern phenomenon, but interestingly, they're also an ancient phenomenon. Rome was able to feed itself because it had access to the sea. The sea meant it could get the food in from much further away. It was about 50 times cheaper to import food by water than over land, which was why it was able to conquer places like Carthage and Egypt and then suck all the grain up into the city by ship. Um, and there are so many parallels with the way Rome fed itself and the way we feed ourselves now including the fact that local farmers only grew so-called pastio velatica, which is kind of, you know, nut stuff, dormice and snails and kind of other luxury foods. And also the fact that the enormous hinterland that, that the city relied on uh, gradually became salinated because it was, the city was simply sucking all the nutrients up. Um, I also discovered other things. So the city not only shapes the landscape by its need to eat, but is shaped by food coming into the city. So these uh, images of, of London in the 16th century just give you some idea of how the food is flowing into the city and street names like Bread Street, uh, on the the grain diagram show you you know that sort of the, the food as it was flowing up to Cornhill where it was traded it was being actually bought and sold fish street Friday street is where you bought your fish on a Friday when the eating of meat was forbidden poultry where bank is today is where all the turkeys and geese waddled into the city little cloth shoes to protect their feet Smithfield was a smooth field outside Newgate where all the cows walk themselves in. And of course, animals provide their own transport, which is one of the great benefits of them uh, from places like Wales and Scotland and came into the city. Um, and I also discovered that geography has a massive effect on the way you know, we basically think and the way we set up our economies and politics. Uh, another quiz I like to have is basically, can you spot the difference between these two images of London on the left and Paris on the right? Um, and again, I'll give you the answer. On the left, you have ocean going vessels and on the right, you have river barges. And that basically tells you everything you need to know about how geography influenced the political history and the mindset of uh, England, both England uh, and the UK, the greater UK and Paris. Daisy's appeared, that can't mean I've had 12 minutes, does it? I've got one minute left. Okay, that's terrible. Right, I'm just going to have to go phenomenally fast. I do apologize. Railways came along and that was the end of geography. Um, cities exploded, uh, the productive hinterland also exploded. It was the beginning of cheap meat uh, because there was a sort of grain glut for the first time in history and people started feeding it to animals. That was a really bad idea, ecological catastrophe. Um, but in fact, we, we've built our lives around this thing called cheap food, which doesn't actually exist because here are some of the externalities and the world's turning into a hamburger. COVID's reminding us that it's a global phenomenon. We're all in this together. It's reminded us, and thank goodness, Michael already explained a lot of this, <laughs> how fragile our food system is. Um, but also it's showing us amazing possibilities for resilience, people cooking at home, new food networks bringing up and so on. So the thing is, we need to rethink uh, the question, as Cedric Price said, technology is the answer, but what was the question? The point is it hasn't changed since the utopians were trying to work out how to feed themselves all those years ago. Uh, and this is why I made up this word, Zootopia. It actually means food place. It's a kind of food-based uh, practical alternative to utopia, which is good but can't exist. Um, the question's always been the same, how do we eat? Uh, and the question is then, how does feeding ourselves in one way or another lead to a good life? So there's the slow way and the fast way, 20% of meals in America. This is a stat from Michael, which I love, are eaten in cars, which is just insane. So it's about valuing food, which we only do in a crisis, and COVID's just the latest in those. It's about working with nature clearly and not against it, as everybody in this panel keeps saying. It's about democratizing a food system, again, as Michael said. So on the left, we have monopoly. On the right-hand side, we have democracy. And that's what the food system, do, the food network does. Um, and ultimately, it's about making space for food in our lives and in our minds. And 
bringing city and country together in various ways. Um, my metaphor for good society is one in which everybody eats well, uh, because you can't live well without eating well. And also, I'd like to offer you food as a way of seeing the world, because basically, um, food shapes everything and it's everywhere and it's too big to see. So just stick food shaped glasses on and you'll be fine. If we value food, we'll be fine. We can build a better utopia. And thank you very much. That went incredibly fast. <laughs>